so I think people have seen this slide, uh, but the interesting element here is that uh, we obviously peaked out. Uh, this is software multiples and where they're trading in the public markets. Uh, we peaked out in uh, high growth software in 2020 at 27 times uh, NTM ARR for high growth. I think what's interesting here is this was kind of the canonical me metric for a long time of valuing uh, public software companies, right, as well as private businesses. Uh, the, the interesting point, I guess, in all of this is if you look, there's a tightening of spread that's actually occurred between high growth and mid growth. And it's gotten as tight down here as it exists ever um, between the difference between companies growing over 30% and companies growing 15 to 30%. So why is that the case? Obviously, interest rates, you know, everyone's sort of seen the graph of interest rates up software multiples down, right? So why is this spread tightening happening? Well, the easy answer here is this actually isn't the best way of looking at valuations now in the public markets, right? This, we've always sort of known there's a balance between growth and profitability that exists. And so in the public markets, what we're seeing now is actually this trade-off occurring. And so what you see here on the white, in the white line, uh, this is revenue growth for all these public software companies. And so you see revenue growth tailing off over the course of the year. Obviously, there's macro impacts that are driving that, right? And uh, there's demand at the customer base and inflation, CPI, all that stuff flowing through. But also, there's quite literally the dials that occur within the business, right? And that is the free cash flow versus revenue growth dynamic that exists and what actually gets rewarded in the public markets. And so if you look, as revenue declined, free cash flow went up. And the reason for that, in, by and large, is companies were cutting headcount. And so if you look down here across the bottom, companies were being very rewarded in the public markets for doing layoffs, for a willingness to act more efficiently. I think today, Facebook announced a 10% workforce reduction, and their shares traded up as well. And so now, we've always known these dials exist between growth and free cash flow, and the public market went from saying, hey, we care about this thing, to hey, we care about this other thing, and the balance of growth and efficiency. And that's flowing through our businesses as well, right? This is not in a vacuum. Public market is often the leading indicator for our companies and where how we think about things. And so this is something that we've definitely taken into consideration. We've had companies across the portfolio do rifts and try to be more efficient with their, their cash management. And so it's definitely driven as a leading indicator from this here. The other thing we're seeing is this fall, uh, we talked about the four different quadrants. And uh, I'll, I'll orient people here for a second. But uh, the, the, the top quadrant here is revenue growth, right? Uh, and, or sorry, the, the bottom quadrant here is revenue growth. The top quadrant here is free cash flow as a percentage of revenue. And what you see if you orient yourself, basically, the worst companies are in the bottom left. These are the companies that are burning cash and are growing slowly. The best companies are in the top right. Right? And so if you look at, this is actually the share price drop of all the companies that fit into those different buckets. Which businesses held up the best? Well, it was actually the best companies. Right? If you look, 32% drop versus 50% drop makes sense in a lot of ways, but there's been a flight to quality in the public markets. The companies that have held up from a stock price standpoint are the businesses that have the best balance of both growth and free cash flow, right? And this is something we're also seeing in the private markets as well. There's definitely a flight to quality of A-plus companies. And that's a place we've always wanted to invest in. We've always wanted to invest in the market leaders and the companies that we choose to work with. But we're seeing it more and more, and it's definitely reflected in the public markets. So here you see, again, uh, the macro headwinds are starting to strengthen. And this is, again, the same basket of public software companies. And so if you look on the left-hand side here, these are the uh, companies by quarter and whether or not they made or missed their, their numbers. On the right-hand side, this is where they were versus analyst estimates. And what's interesting is while you see uh, analyst estimates and guidance continue to trend down further and further for these businesses, actually you saw a slight uptick in Q3 of companies beating their number. And this is, at least anecdotally, something we're seeing in the private markets as well, that perhaps Q3 was the bottoming out of the macro dynamics. And people were taking their medicine more and more. We definitely saw some of our portfolio companies revising plan. Uh, with the intent of beating those numbers later on. And so I think this trend of companies guiding lower and lower and realizing the macro impact that's flowing through their business with the hopes of beating those numbers later on, it's possible that this is the bottoming out of what we're going to see, at least from a macro endpoint, uh, impact standpoint in the public markets. And I think, again, that all of that stuff flows through to our business as well on the private side. The good news here is that uh, while software spending at a macro level 
is slowing in growth, it is still growing, right? And so this is growth expectations from, uh, from CIOs and IT professionals and what they expect to grow, grow. And so even in this major pullback, right, we're seeing growth decline for sure, but we're not seeing declining numbers. And so there still is the growth rate from where it was in the peak of Q3, yes, 1.6% is meaningful dollars. But again, these are trends that we're investing behind that we think have major growth potential. And even in this very uh, uncertain environment in these uncertain times, we feel like the macro tailwinds are still at our back. And we're gonna see this digital transformation play out over the course of the next two, three, four, or five years. Uh, we've seen this, we showed this slide before. This is a little bit of an illustrative one uh, when we, last time we spoke to you in March of 2022, of how things could potentially play out, how long it typically takes from peak venture dollars into the private technology market to the bottoming out before it ultimately rebounds back around. We went back and looked, and it was between nine and 10 quarters, right? That was how long it took in the internet bubble and the global financial crisis for the peak dollars raised to then bottom out into the venture ecosystem. We're only four quarters into that. We could be, if, if history repeats in some way, and there's a lot of reasons to believe maybe this is gonna be shorter than it has been, but if history repeats, that means we're gonna be looking at another five, six quarters before ultimately the bottoming out of dollars going into the venture ecosystem. So here's a quick anecdotal observations that we're seeing. And when we get into the Omega-4 presentation, I'm gonna uh, explain a little bit about why uh, we only made one investment last year and some of the things that we're seeing on the uh, uh, private market, at least at that stage. But here's a little anecdotal observations. Um, one of the interesting things last year was we actually saw early stage valuations correct much faster than uh, Series B, Series C, Series D. The reason for that is a little counterintuitive. You would think that later stage valuations would correct faster because they're closer to the public markets, right? Therefore, more indexed to price coming down. But what we saw actually was there was very limited supply for Series B and Series C companies. And so there weren't that many data points. The companies that went out, no one really knew exactly how to value them. And so ultimately, someone was willing to pay a price that someone would have paid six, nine months ago for the business. And so it was kind of very, uh, very few data points ultimately on how to value those companies. Versus in the early stage, it was business as usual for the most part, right? There was definitely a slight haircut on these valuations, but the supply coming to market was very consistent. And I think that holds with the number of investments that our early stage team made as well over the course of last year. These companies ultimately, you're not really gonna be right or wrong if the difference in price is 40 or 50 million, right? And so the, the delta, delta in price, these were businesses that need to raise, they wanted a good partner, and so they went out and chose who they wanted to work with. Series B and Series C, a lot of these companies had lots of cash. They didn't need to go out and raise money. And so they ultimately burrowed down and held and said, hey, why go out in this uncertain market environment? Why do I need to raise? I'll just wait for things to slow down. And so there was a little bit of adverse selection to the companies that were fundraising in the back half of last year. So we'll go into a little bit more specific details of that. I think in the second half, we definitely saw price correction start to flow through the ecosystem, but the data points were not, not as many as we would like to see. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail when we get into the Omega part of the presentation. So uh, two principal reasons of why we didn't invest more in 2022 here. So number one, the valuations. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail, but there was an unprecedented disconnect between valuations in the public markets and those that we saw in our core market of Series B and Series C. And then there was the supply uh, opportunity. I think we talked about this a little bit in the earlier slides. But first half of the year, there were definitely companies raising back half of the year. But those were all at very elevated uh, valuation uh, valuations. Back half of the year, it was some adverse selection. These were the companies that needed to raise, not the ones that uh, we wanted to invest in necessarily. And so definitely some adverse picking with the businesses that were out there. So uh, unpre unprecedented disconnect between public and private markets. So what we did here is we talked about in the fall, we have this proprietary data set of software businesses that we track, right? Uh, and at the point of an individual round, if it's done by a firm that we 
respect, we compete with, we invest alongside, we'll, we'll call that a, a peer deal, a quality deal, if you will. And that's really a means of assessing the universe of businesses out there. It's entirely subjective. We do it at the point in time. We have some heuristics about which firms fall into that bucket and which firms don't. But generally, it's a decision made at that point in time. Hey, is this an investment that we would have at least liked to consider? Right. So those are the considerations with it. Uh, what you'll see here across the top is this is high growth software revenue multiples. So high growth is defined in the public markets over 30%. Uh, this is LTM so that we can compare it with ARR, right? Both of them are trailing, obviously a little bit of a difference there, but that's the data that we had. And what you'll see here is actually 2021, the spread that existed between public markets and private markets was far narrower than what we saw in 2022. Now, both were elevated versus what we saw the prior couple of years, right? But this was the spread that existed between these Series B and Series C businesses and then high growth public software companies. Now we expect a spread, right? The companies that we're investing in in the private markets are growing at 250%, 200%, 150%, 300%, whatever it is. It's growing far faster and so you expect that delta to definitely exist. But as we saw uh, over the course of 2022, public markets came down, private markets didn't, right? So, and then the other thing that we saw as well was this is the point on adverse selection. So this is the same data set that we track, Series B and Series C, peer quality deals that we evaluate. And if you look, very heightened over the course of 2021, you saw it really taper off over the back half of last year. So the companies that were going out and raising were not, it, one, there weren't a lot of them, and two, these were not the same quality companies that we wanted to evaluate. So what does that mean? for us in 2023, what does that mean for the rest of Omega-4? Well, we're far more optimistic about 2023 in this environment, and in particular as it starts to get into the, the beginning of next year, and I'll explain why. So first, uh, valuations. So if you look at the quarterly trend, which we will hear in a second, we're starting to see sanity reemerge in the private market pricing, which is a good thing. Uh, as well, there's also a major backlog of supply. And so we talked about earlier how the pace of investment for the early stage team over the course of 2022 was fairly consistent. Well, ultimately those businesses are gonna need to come and raise. And so that presents an opportunity for us as well. So here's that same slide, uh, but now on a quarterly basis. And so what you'll see is actually the peak of irrationality, if you will, the peak of disconnect was in Q2 of 2022. Makes sense when you think about it, right? Public markets came down, private markets stay elevated. There's definitely some time delay between signing a term sheet and ultimately investing. But if you look, that was the peak of spread. If you, if you remember 2018, 2019, one and a half to two was the usual spread. Well, here we were up to almost eight times. Now the trend line, the good news is the trend line as software multiples continue to go down and then ultimately rebound up a little bit in the public markets, we've continued to see a tapering off from valuations in the private markets. This data is incomplete, obviously we're still in the middle of Q1, but we are seeing some level of more rationality emerge to the companies that are actually raising. Then the second point here is the supply. So what you're seeing here is the amount of time that companies are waiting in between fundraisings. And so what you saw in 2021, in the back half of 2020, was companies were waiting less than a year before they went and raised a subsequent round. Now we're seeing that line, since the back half of 2021, shoot up higher and higher. Now companies are waiting up to 18 months. I think we're gonna see this continue to tick higher and higher, maybe 24, so that they can grow into their valuations. Now, that's possible because they raised a lot of money, and so they can wait and try to, try to figure out to grow into the multiple that it might require to raise that subsequent round. And so I think with this trend, the good news that we're going to see play out over the course of this year, beginning of next year as well, is there's this major backlog of supply that exists in the market. And so if you look, these are the funds that we track their investments, the upstream investors to us, the peers of our early stage team, the competitors of our early stage team. You saw a major uptick over the course of 2021 for, in the first half of 2022 from firms investing in these Series A's. Ultimately, these businesses are gonna need to go out and fundraise again, right? They might wait 18 months, they might wait 24 months, but this quantum of businesses are gonna have to go out and that presents a great opportunity for us. And so we're patient, we're waiting, we wanna make sure we're picking the right businesses. I don't want the takeaway from this to be that we're waiting for valuations to fully correct. This is the big input to us, is we wanna see those quality businesses come back out there. And I think anecdotally, the amount of activity we've seen in the last six weeks 
is probably greater than the amount we saw in the, back, the prior six months of 2022. And so I think we're, we're seeing this more and more, and the A-plus businesses are actually going out and proactively fundraising. So that makes us optimistic about this balance and the time diversification that we're going to see for the balance 60% uh, of Omega-4, and I think should be bullish on the, uh, the opportunity from here. So with that, Great time to invest. So we talked about absolute valuations falling and market uh, opportunities remaining large. Uh, there are fewer competitors going into any individual category. So that's an important point to think about. But every time we invested in the past, it used to be you invested in, in one business and then you had an opportunity to s expand your product set and sell more products to that single buyer. Over the last two years, we saw not just a competitor emerge to copy what you did, but then people to jam in right to the left or right of you to decrease wallet share that you could take. I think in the, the slowing of the venture market, we're going to see abilities to increase ACVs, the abilities to expand product sets and consolidate tools, which will be an opportunity. The other two points I know our early stage team is seeing as well is there's definitely a flight to quality for founders looking uh, for people like us to actually roll up our sleeves and help. Uh, capital was definitely, there were elements of it that were commoditized, particularly at Series B, C, D especially. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more founders, especially over the course of the last four days, appreciative of people that are actually gonna roll up their sleeves and help. Uh, and then finally, financing constraints are leading to better businesses. So uh, it's not just grow at all costs. A lot of the best businesses that have been started and exist in the public markets, be it Atlassian or FIVA or whatever it is, got there by uh, being constrained in the amount of capital they consumed. And so this is a good muscle for our companies to get as well.